everyone. Uh, thank you all for being here. Very excited to talk about my PhD work today. So, uh, the overarching topic of my research is the evolution of uh, sexual dimorphism, including the evolution of ornaments and weapons, but also body size dimorphism. So, uh, what ecological factors affect the evolution of uh, sexual dimorphism? And why is it that a few species produce these large, elaborated, sexually dimorphic structures while other related taxa do not? And I address these questions in stick insects. So stick insects, uh, there are about 3,000 species. They're of course uh, very well known for their amazing camouflage abilities. But they're also very interesting when it comes to sexual dimorphism. Because sexual dimorphism is extremely variable in this group of insects with the main pattern of the male being much smaller uh, than the females. And this is likely due to selection on females for larger sizes to increase fecundity, while males are probably selected for smaller sizes to increase mobility and efficiency at uh, searching scattered females. So now that you know about the main pattern found in stick insects, I will actually spend the rest of this talk talking about the two lineages that completely break this rule for which the males are uh, giants compared to related taxa and are almost as big as their female. So uh, they're quite obvious when we map the evolution of body size on the tree of stick insects. And we find the Lord White and stick insects and the thorny devil stick insects. And this is an amazing case of convergent evolution towards what has been called uh, the tree lobster morphology. So the females look like each other, the males look like each other, and on top of that, males of <coughs> both species have enlarged hind legs with a sharp spine. They also behave quite similarly. They are nocturnal ground dwellers, and they gather in large groups inside tree cavities during the day. And this is completely unique for stick insects that tend to be solitary, and this gregariousness is really the key to my story today. So the questions I'm going to address today are really what conditions drove the evolution of these exaggerated hind legs in tree lobsters, what are their fitness benefits, and I will briefly mention what is their cost. So I can't mention the Lord Hawaiian stick insect without telling its unusual story. It is considered the rarest insect in the world. There are only 17 individuals left uh, in the wild in this uh, volcanic stack in the middle of the ocean uh, off the east coast of Australia. They were thought to be extinct on Lord Howe Island uh, in the 1930s after the introduction of rats on the island, only to be rediscovered in 2001, so 70 years later, uh, on this uh, rock, basically on the unique bush of their host plant, uh, 100 meters above the sea level on the cliff. So they are, of course, of major conservation concern, and a reintroduction project is on its way, but for now you will understand why I focused my effort on the other lineage. <laughs> <laughs> the thorny devils, because the thorny devils, on the contrary, are quite abundant in Papua New Guinea. They are actually a major pest of all palm plantations there. Uh, here you can see the um, dimorphism in their hind legs. And note how sharp the male spine is, because the male femurs were actually used as fish hooks by uh, natives of Papua New Guinea. So um, to address this question of, and to understand the evolution of this unusual morphology, I went to Papua New Guinea to do some field observation in some thorny devils and characterize their natural history, uh, as well as uh, conducted lab experiments, especially uh, mesocosm trials. So the first hypothesis to explain the evolution of these crazy legs is uh, the anti de defense hypothesis which is the main hypothesis found in the literature. Um, and indeed, um, thorny devils use these hind legs to defend themselves against vertebrate predators in quite a spectacular way. I don't know why it froze. Uh, so they basically swing their legs and try to grab the, the attacker. And the legs are uh, strong enough to penetrate the flesh of the vertebrate predators and trust my um, Field assistant, it really hurts. So uh, to explain why the legs are sexually dimorphic for this hypothesis, then we need to predict that somehow the males would be more exposed to predators than females. And I tested that uh, in the field using radio telemetry. Um, so I tested whether males actually traveled or moved more than the females across the landscape. But there was no such evidence at all. If anything, females were uh, actually more mobile than the males. And uh, overall, there was no obvious behavioral differences between uh, males and females that would make males 
more uh, exposed to predators. So we can reject that first hypothesis. The second hypothesis that I tested was uh, what I call a sexual conflict hypothesis. So the idea is that in stick insect, and especially in this species, females have the ability to reproduce without males through parthenogenesis. And parthenogenesis can have some short-term fitness benefits and actually select for females to try and stay unmated. And there's a precedent for this. Uh, in spiny leaf insects, virgin females have been shown to uh, actively resist male copulation attempts. So my idea then in, is that in thorny devils, maybe the males are using these big hind legs to uh, overcome that uh, resistance. So what I predicted first was that males would, would somehow use their hind legs to grasp the females during copulation. And it's like, as you can see on this drawing, the males actually do. They wrap one of their hind legs around the female abdomen uh, during copulation. And then I predicted that males with the larger legs should be better at overcoming that female resistance and that also females should be resisting male copulation attempts. But I didn't find any correlation between mating latency and the size of the legs of the male. So males with larger legs don't copulate faster. And this is basically because the female don't seem to resist at all, as you can see on this video here. So here you can see a female making its way up the trunk in the field and uh, copulating with two uh, consecutive males, but not resisting at all. And also this video really highlights the high levels of polyandry in this system. And finally, for this hypothesis, uh, I was expecting also to find that parthenogenesis would be somehow beneficial for female fitness. But surprisingly, unmated females died uh, in the lab on average 30% sooner than mated females. And they also had a much lower fecundity. They laid uh, half as many eggs as mated females, had a lower hatching rate, and a higher offspring mortality. All of this telling us that uh, staying unmated for these females doesn't seem to be great compared to sexual reproduction. Okay, so this leads us to the third hypothesis which is male-male competition. These legs may be sexually selected weapons. So the predictions then are fairly straightforward. Males should fight for access to these females. Winners should have bigger weapons and fighting success should translate into mating success. So the question is, do males fight in the field? Yes, they do and quite vigorously, uh, as you can see on this video here. So here you only see males uh, that are waiting for the females to come out of the cavities and here is a female, and two males will basically fight for access to that female, one on top of the other one, and the one on top is squeezing the other one with uh, his, its hind leg. And once the conflict uh, here is over, we have the winner coming back to copulate with the female. All right, now let's have a closer look at uh, the social conditions that these um, males are experiencing in the wild to uh, really uh, understand why they benefit from fighting. So the females leave the cavities uh, on average two hours after sunset, and then 45 minutes to one hour later, they go scatter to forage uh, in the canopy. And the time when they come back to the cavities for nesting during the day is way, uh, way less predictable, as you can see here, in that orange curve. So from a male perspective, the only time when the females are uh, grouped and predictable in where they're going to be is really between the time when they leave the cavity and when they go feed in the canopy. <coughs> so that time here, that I call the moment of truth. Um, and the males behave quite accordingly, so they leave the cavities just before the females. And this is also that time during when we see the highest numbers of males waiting on the, on the trunk. So this is an illustration of that time here. Um, and this is also where we see the most male aggressive interactions. So basically males are fighting for strategic locations on the trunk to be able to intercept as many females as possible. And this time is also when we see the most matings. And finally, after uh, this moment has passed, very interestingly, males switch from a guarding strategy to an actively searching strategy they basically start behaving like a normal stick insect and they uh, try to search actively for the female on the trunk, on the ground, or in the canopy. 
So during those aggressive interactions, it's the biggest males with the largest weapons that wins. And this um, fighting success translates very well into mating success. So dominant males that control territory get twice as many copulations as uh, the other males. And basically all the predictions for this hypothesis are met. It seems that these uh, hind legs are actually the product of sexual selection. So to sum things up, uh, it seems that um, really that cavity nesting behavior um, results in those fe in that female clustering at one moment in time that creates an opportunity for males to um, monopolize access to several females. And uh, in this context, it appears advantageous to be larger and more armored. <coughs> I also looked at the biomechanics and physiology of these legs to try to find a potential limit to weapon size in this system. I don't have time to go into details here, but basically the bottom line is that uh, larger weapons are disproportionately stronger um, than smaller ones. And this is thanks to a disproportionate investment in the large muscles that, is, that are found in these, in these legs. But these muscles come at, come at a significant metabolic cost of maintenance potentially uh, setting a limit to size in this system. All right, and with that, I have a lot of people to thank, especially my collaborators in Papua New Guinea and National Geographic for founding my trip there. And I will leave you with uh, a video in real time of these fights so that you can appreciate how fast these guys are uh, while, I, while I answer some questions. Thank you. Exactly the same, scorpion like okay. posture. Um, yeah, it just hurt less, but they still do it. What kind of So basically, I, I found that uh, males with the larger legs have a, low, a higher metabolic rate, resting metabolic rate. And this is really uh, explained by the. Yeah, yeah, this is really explained by the mass of the muscles in their legs. Uh, so there's an independent effect of the leg size from body size. Uh, do you have any idea of the extent of polyandry? And could potentially certain competitions are you selected? Uh, that's a very good question, no. So I, I was yeah one of the first ones to actually look at these things in the wild. I only stayed there for months. Now the females live for eight months as adults. But I have seen females copulate seven or eight times a night. So that's a lot of uh, potential partners. So I, I don't know how, uh, it, it seems that males don't seem to guard the females when they have copulated. So suggesting maybe a first male precedence, uh, but I don't know at that stage. Are both sexes present in the communal, or the group nests? Yes. But, but Yes, yeah, so, um, yeah, and it seems that the sex ratios are very 50-50 uh, most of the time. Uh, there is a slight trend towards larger males being in more female bias cavities. But overall, I would say the cavities are so narrow that the males can't copulate in there. Uh, that's my guess for why they can really care who is in there. Uh, thank you.